watch it. I think they'll be give it a very wide berth indeed. You might find a hyena goes and gives it a sniff or two. But I think it's high enough off the ground for them not to be able to get at it. Although they, I suppose they could pull the string and pull it down. I think those would be the only things that I'd be worried about giving it a real bite, would be some hyenas. Maybe lions as well, but I wouldn't say anything else will go anywhere near it. I think even baboons would be quite nervous of it. They would eventually get over their nerves, of course. But as we know, there are not a lot of baboons in this particular region of wasabi sands. I think all the herbivores, the wildebeest, the impala, the zebras, the elephants too, will give it a very wide berth. Thank you, Jean, for that. The little one, it always astounds me and everybody, I suppose, how it is that those little elephants don't get stomped on. Vilma, you're in Michigan, which I imagine is experiencing something of a relief from the winter at this stage, which must be wonderful. I've always thought Michigan sounds like a pretty cold place to be. So as we get cooler, Michigan will be getting warmer. And Vilma, you want to know what's the survival rate of an elephant calf like that in comparison with, say, a lion or leopard cub? The answer is quite a lot higher. So only about 10% of male cubs born make it to adulthood to dominate a territory. That's one in 10 male cubs, uh, that's lions. Leopards, it might be slightly higher than that, maybe 15 to 20%. I'd say you'd find that with elephants, because they have the protection of this herd, and of course the herd is not something that any other animals are going to have a go at, uh, unless they're seriously is isolated or seriously ill, because of the protection afforded by the herd, you'll find that that little one, I'd say, has at least a 60% chance of reaching adulthood. That's a very nice question. And it just goes to show that, well, first of all, size, and secondly, protection in numbers are the best ways to go out here if you want to survive. Generally, all the predators will have a much lower survival rate than, <laughs> look at that little thing trying to use his trunk. Uh, Tim, you're in Arkansas. <laughs> I'm just laughing at that little baby there. You want to know how or what age they'll be weaned? An elephant will normally be weaned, Tim, at about two years. But they'll start eating grass a lot before that. Yeah, just learning to use the trunk there, you can see, just managing to pick up one solitary piece of grass. Now, of course, when I first saw the mother, I thought there's no way she'd be able to pick up one piece of grass with that trunk. She's lost the prehensile or finger-like tip to that trunk, but she is able to. I watched her do it just before you came live. She picked up an individual grass stalk and put it in her mouth. So she uses it like a vacuum cleaner or a hoover, that big trunk. And of course, the muscles are like concertinas, so she can extend it down to the ground, where the others just kind of flop their trunks onto the ground. She can push it down onto the ground. And every so often when she blows out, there's quite a lot of moisture that flows out of her trunk. And I don't see that in many of the other elephants. Maybe it's just the fact that she's uh, inhaling quite a lot of dust. Or like Brian, her sinuses object to the amount of pollen that there is in the air at the moment. How are you doing today, Brian? Mm, not too bad. Not too bad. Mm. Good. So just before Tim's question, I was trying to get across to you that all of the animals out here, even in Parla, they've got about a 50% survival rate into their first birthday and probably, say, 50% again into, well, maybe 30 or 40%. <laughs> this, That's, uh... this is how it happened. Watch. There we go. Mm. That is precisely how we got the poop marks on the skull. Delicious. Anyway, like I was saying, uh, even Impala probably have got about a 30 to 40% chance of reaching adulthood. No, maybe a 30% chance of reaching adulthood. But all of the predators have a much reduced chance because they tend to be a lot more territorial and life is a lot tougher as a predator. Is it eating the poo-poo? Mm -hmm. 
Now, this is interesting. As Brian has pointed out, that little elephant is putting its nose into its mother's poop and eating it. Now, you will never, well, you'd hardly ever find a carnivore doing the same thing. But remember, an elephant's dung is hardly digested at all, so there's still a lot of good nutrition in that. But the main importance and reason for this little elephant to be tasting its mother's poop is that it is filled with bacteria, good bacteria that the little elephant will need to line its gut with in order that it too may digest plant material once it has weaned. Look at those little ears flapping like a sort of miniature Dumbo. And you'll find that with all ruminants, uh, all herbivores basically, which need bacteria in the gut to digest the indigestible parts of plants like cellulose and lignin, they will all have to get that done from at least get that bacteria from the dung of other members of the same species. Even termites will eat each other's dung in order to line the gut. Very, very, very few organisms have got the enzymes themselves, or produce the enzymes themselves, to digest plant material. Amazing little herd. And they will all look after this little one. You'll see how the little one feels very comfortable around all of them. Constantly going up and saying hi and putting its trunk in their mouths. That's how they say hi. Right, as those elephants disappear off towards the western horizon, we are going to disappear too and leave you in the capable, excited, and uh, strangely hatted form of Sam Chevalier. Good afternoon, everyone. How exciting to be back in the Sabi Sands with you all today. Wow, jeepers, eh? it's, I feel like I'm in the hot seat again. It's great to be back with uh, this ecology, with the people that I met a few weeks ago, and how exciting it was to, to get the email to say, you know, you have an opportunity to be back in the Sabi Sands in the most beautiful part of the country that I, you know, where I first learned about ecology and everything. And it's such a privilege to be, to be back here and with you. Um, yeah, we are sitting with Buffalo, and this is actually the first place where I started on my interview. I'm, I must say, that was when I was so nervous. I was so nervous when I first, that first live scenario came on me. It was three, two, one. Sam, you are live, you are live. And now it's happened again at the same dam with the beautiful buffaloes just ahead of us here. You can see there's a number of them in there at the moment. Earlier today, I was just on the other side there uh, with James. I just want to mention to James, he has been incredible during my time here. Uh, from, from the interview to this moment, uh, he, he's helped me. And he's, this morning, he really gave me the opportunity to build confidence and, and grow into this space. And I heard you just had a, an amazing sighting with him, with the young elephants on the other side. That's great. James, thank you very much for all of that. But here we are with the buffs, and you can see it's been an exceptionally hot afternoon. Um, I've, you know, I don't really know what it's been like since, since I was last year, but as you can see, it is so green here. I mean, the last time I was here, it was completely dry, and there was, there was no, nothing in there. And we did a rain dance, myself, James, and I think it was, was it, was, was it Dave? I think it was Dave, and we did a rain, rain dance the night before, and, um, and when we did that rain dance, James got me out the car, and I was dancing in front of a whole bunch of people that I'd never met, <laughs> um, which was awesome. I really enjoyed that experience, and, you know, luck have it that there was rain that night. And um, the next day, I was welcomed by two beautiful hyenas in this watering hole, and it looked like they were the happiest creatures on the planet as they swam in this watering hole and yes so I was extremely lucky to have had that experience 
but as we sit here, you can see that there's some buffalo just in the one next to us here. And I've been told the dam cam is just here. So this must be the place where all the viewers around the world are watching the bush every single day. And I must say, I was watching every day myself, well, when I could, um, and I really, really enjoyed watching this watering hole. And, you know, I've heard some great stories that have had, that have been had at this watering hole um, over the last, last few months. But I just, yeah, so this is an incredible encounter. I'm really excited to be back in the northeast of South Africa, back of the home of the buffalo, lions, leopards, and butterflies, and everything that comes with this ecology. With that, I'm gonna say thank you so much to these buffs who are sitting here in the heat and just cooling themselves off. You can see that they're um, ox peckers that are flying around there eating off the parasites that are on the, the buffs. And this is, a, this is a cleaning process for the buffalo. So there they're having a beautiful bath as well as a clean from the ox peckers. And with that, we're gonna go off into the, I think that's the east, and we're gonna go and see what we can find. Um, I'm ready to go. I hope you're ready to join me on my first drive at Wild Earth, South Africa. Oof. I'm so glad I managed to get on drive. Earlier I wasn't, um, I was told that I wasn't gonna be able to go on drive because the vehicle, Wendy, this is Wendy, wasn't feeling so well this afternoon and cheap as I was quite upset because I was getting all ready and excited for my first drive for Wild Earth TV. So here I am, finally driving, and I'm super excited because I saw next to me was James's hat. And um, as you can see on top of my head, I have my lucky hat with me, which is my bush hat. And it's been with me from the first uh, ever into the bush. My dad bought it for me, and um, I've just loved it and cherished it. And here we are with James's hat. So I feel very lucky today, and hopefully we'll come across something out there. Please remember that this is a live showing, so you are able to contact us by, twi by Twitter and the YouTube channel that would be able to ask us questions, and I can do my best at answering you, and uh, we can have an interactive ex experience. Hello, Chan and Maryland. What am I most excited to see? Wow. To be honest, at this point, I'm excited to see pretty much everything. Um, I've only just, you know, I haven't been in the bush for a long time since the interview, and even before that, it had been a, a long time, about a year and a half since I entered the, the Sabi Sands, or even the bush for that matter. So at the moment, these, buff, these buffalo that are sitting to the left of us, and uh, we've got Chandre behind the camera today, and he's going to be doing my first drive, and I'm really excited. He drove me up from Joburg, and um, they're the buffs again, relaxing in the midday sun. But yes, Jan, I'm very excited for this drive. You know, to be honest, I, I would love to see anything, whether it's a, a, a butterfly to a, to a wild dog. Um, it's a privilege to be back in this area, so I'm happy to see anything, even that beautiful termite mound in the distance there. I would also like to, to send a big thank you to all the viewers that were sending me messages during the time between the interview and uh, the final day. You guys really encouraged me and um, you made me feel like I, there was a chance and a possibility and that I had the confidence to really be uh, a natural guide here in the Sabi Sands. Um, you really spurred my decision to, to be here. So, you know, as much as you say, well done, I must say thank you for, for giving, me, giving me that confidence that I need to build into my future as a safari guide in this industry. And with that, guys, thank you so much for the first little viewing. Uh, we're going to link back to James. Enjoy the rest of the drive with James, and I'll see you just now. 
Hello, hello. I am just looking at the road, frantically hoping that the lions have not crossed this road into a fiendish block over there full of very thorny, prickly, thick things. And so far, they haven't. Now, this morning, the lions went to sleep, as I said, and then, because it wasn't very hot, they decided to do what lions don't ever do, and that's move after 9 o'clock in the morning. And I think, from what we can tell, that they went into the drainage line just to the northern side of where they were lying. So they were lying through this thicket to the right-hand side of your screen. Well, now it's dead straight in front of your screen. And between us and where they were this morning is a little drainage line, very shaded. They like to lie on the cooling sand during the middle of the day, and I suspect that they are in there. I do not see any sign of their tracks crossing this road, which is a good thing, because it is very, very thick up in there. But there have been lots of elephants walking up and down this road. That herd that we saw this morning was in here. And that means that they could have walked over the top of the lions. So if you don't mind, while we chat, I'm just going to keep looking at the ground, which is an odd thing to do unless you are tracking lions or something else. And we'll see what else we can find. Thank you for being so nice to Sam. He seems to be enjoying himself. And that means, of course, that uh, hopefully you will enjoy yourselves too. There's a real strong smell of elephant dung around the place. Uh, here he is. Here's the man himself. Hello. I'm in James. How are you? Very well, thanks. How was your world premiere? That was great. Sir. Was it good? It was a good start. Sir. I told him that I had your lucky cap. Oh, thank you. And that's a spot lucky for me a little bit of black. Right. Well, you carry on with my lucky cap then. That's <laughs> that's excellent. Okay. Um, no lion tracks. No, not that I've seen. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Good luck. Andre, do tell them about your foot. I told them you would. That's called dropping a mate in it, as it were. I don't know if Jandre is going to tell you about his foot, but it has to do with a high lift jack, a faulty um, hand brake, and a little bit of hubris, I think. Anyway, Jandre is on crutches at the moment. So, given that we have not seen any tracks here at all, I'm going to just stick my nose in here. But not before we've looked at this butterfly. Brian, there's an African migrant on this yellow flower over here. Do you see it? No. Oh, but Brian, look, there it is. There, look. Your arm was in the way. Where? There it is now. Sorry about that. That is an African migrant, everybody. My favorite mint-colored little butterfly and it is eating from the blooms of Justitia flava, which is that tree. Well, it's not really a tree so much as a herbaceous plant, isn't it? Is it, Brian? Yeah. And a butterfly has got a long proboscis on it, and that long proboscis will probe for nectar. I just think these are my favorite butterflies. They've been all over the place all of the summer, and they're just so lovely. Just a very subtle minty green. Ah, beautiful. Isn't that amazing? Just those two spots on the front wing and the hind wing. That's incredible. That's actually an amazing shot from the vehicle. You normally only get those sorts of shots on the bushwalk. You might even be able to see there if you've got a really good screen. Well, now that he's moved, you can't really, but that proboscis, that rolling long, probing sort of mouth part, which is basically a modified tongue. It rolls up and then unfurls into the flowers from which they're seeking nectar. Beautiful. 
OK, let's just stick our noses in here. Um, I don't want to labour the point too much uh, while the day is still so hot. But let's... Well, not so hot, but hot for lions. Just put our noses in here and look down into the drainage, and we might just spot the lions. Like I said, I haven't seen any of their tracks moving further than this point. That's Mary in Michigan, everybody. I would like to know, given that Brian has got allergies and suffers from allergies, pollen and that sort of thing, what time of year would be best for her to come and visit? When will she have the least allergies? Brian, when do you think? Uh, I would say allergies generally run year round. Which <laughs> just depends what you're allergic to. Indeed. For me, I have the dust. The dust really affects my allergies and everything kicks up dust all year round, so it's a, it's a tough one. I think, um, for me, I also get allergies, but not as badly as Brian does. Uh, for me, it's the kind of pollen and stuff that does it for me, so, you know, if you can avoid the flowering season, um, then it's not too bad. But, as Brian says, if dust is a problem for you, then the summer is going to be an issue. At least the winter's going to be an issue. I'm just going to stick my nose through here so we can look down into the drainage. Ease our way gently through here. See how we are easing, Brian? It's much easier to ease in rusty than it is in windy, I must say. I don't see anything in here. Now, what I'm going to do, while we are still live, is I'm just going to walk down into the drainage there and look down the way. OK. So don't go anywhere. Please don't get off the vehicle, anyone. I am, in theory, trained to do this sort of thing. And then I will explain my logic when I get back. And you'll tell me if you lose levels, will you? Mm. OK, that's Brian's thumb he's entertaining you with at the moment. So I'm going to be very quiet, just so that I can hear any rustling in the bushes. And I'm just going to look down into here. It does smell a bit dungish. Anybody. I can't see anything just yet. Nor can I see any tracks. That is very odd. Well, it is precisely in here that the lions went. Oh, there they are. Got them. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter how many times you do that, you see lions on foot, even if they're doing what that one did, and that one kind of just opened its eyes slowly and then shut it again. It's such a thrill. <laughs> They're just, they're just down there in the drainage line. So we'll just pop down there, see if we can wangle Wendy in there and have a look. I don't think they're going to do much, so we probably won't spend too much time with them. But let's go and have a look, just to prove to you that I did find them. Um, OK, let's just ease our way down through here. If it does get a bit thick and unpleasant, we might try and go round from the other side. Look, let's... I'm just going to ease... Let's go down that way, the way I walk. So I think there's less of a bump. So, uh, we had that question about elephants being chilled and lions being 
chilled perhaps and how it is that we can possibly go and track them on foot because I know for a lot of our more seasoned viewers the answer is obvious you know that animals see us as predators and so that's why it is relatively safe if you're trained for this sort of thing to go walking about trying to track lions on foot right nasty thorn to the left everybody please watch out Brian watch out over your head lock the diff <laughs> And I was walking right here, and I looked up the drainage line, and behold, we might be stuck here for some time. <laughs> you can jump! See them moving through there. You see them, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that, I'm afraid. Well, I mean, it's a really nice view, I suppose, for this time of the day because it gives you an idea of what you'd be looking for if you were on foot. And that's what I saw. And they're calling to each other gently. Ooh. Not the best view of lions that you'll ever get. Um. Let me just call them in, and then I'll, we'll try and get one more view, maybe from, maybe from the top or the other side. I'm not actually going to try and bash my way all the way through there. I think we'll get stuck and make a big noise. Stations relocated in Kahuma Pride. They are in the drainage line to the west of where they were this morning. Sorry, to the north of where they were this morning, just to the east of Mvubu Road at the moment. Visual is one out of five. But they are moving around a bit, of course, which is unusual for lions. But the colour is lovely in there, and the dappled light I always find so very peaceful to look at. Brian, do you agree with my assessment that driving up there is probably going to make a horrible noise? Mm. Molly, you say James just about died to a lion on foot. Is that, is that, did I hear you correctly, Molly? Um, I didn't nearly die, Molly, don't worry. Um, much as I do enjoy this job and finding animals for you, I'm not really prepared to risk my life for it at this stage. Uh, it's just not that dangerous to track lions on foot, especially if you know them and if you know how to react to them. And I knew how they would react to me because I've seen them on foot before. So as long as I don't behave in too much of a threatening manner, they will normally just do exactly what they did. They looked up at me and then I moved away and because I didn't push through, uh, they didn't react at all. So Molly, no death was in no way about to happen there, as far as I can tell. Of course, I may just be blissfully ignorant. All right, now there's no thorns here, everyone. So you can move these branches out of the way with your hands. Right there, Brian. Brian, of course, has to look after the camera, his face, and the aerial. I just have to watch that I don't, watch that I don't knock this extremely expensive VR rig the front. There we go. We're out. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, thank goodness we're driving rusty, Brian. If we'd been <laughs> driving Wendy, that would have been the tyre. Mm. Okay, so this is where they were lying this morning. When we came back past there, here they were gone. We were greatly distressed and embarrassed. And they are just inside here, in this thicket. I don't think we're going to get a good view, but we're going to try and just get a view. Yeah, we can see them from here. It's not going to be a great view, though. There we go. There we go. Oops. 
One should turn the ignition off, shouldn't one? Mm. That's the best option. There we go. Phew. Well, there are the lions, everybody. A carpet of resplendent lions lying in the shade, in the dappled shade of a Tambuerti thicket. And they are chilled to the max. Panting a little, because they're hot. And I think it was Lucy in Indiana this morning asked, could they be breathing heavily because the two of them are pregnant? And I had to answer, yes, that is quite possible indeed. All righty. I think we've uh, probably got all we're going to out of this particular lion sighting. So I think we'll wait for them to move out of here, probably as it cools down a little bit later, so we'll go and see what else we can find. And while we're doing that, um, the inimitable Sam Chevalier has got some vegetation to show you, some pretty colorful vegetation. Welcome back, everyone. Here I stand with a round-leaf teak, otherwise known as a pteracarpus redundifolius. And I heard you just found the lions with James. That's epic news. I hope we can sit down together and chat about the lions a bit later. But while we're here, let's have a little look at this plant. This plant I got to know when I first started my training. Um, it's, you know, elephants love it. It's got such, a, like, such an easy uh, tasting bark and it is really good at wrapping its mouth around it and pulling all the bark off the, this whole twig. But here, the, as you can see, it's, uh, it's got very round leaves, and that's how you know it's a Pterocarpus redundifolius, otherwise known as the round leaf teak. And, you know, it's, you know, as my passion is in biomimicry and learning more about the intelligence of the natural world, I like to see how this has intelligence. You know, how does this tree collect its water and, and, and the sunlight and all those little things? And it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's really... Like, astonishes me when I think about how this is collecting its sunlight. Just have a look, if you can, at how this is collecting different shades of sunlight in the afternoon light. And you can imagine in the east, when, it's, when the sun is rising from that direction, it's collecting sun on the other side of the leaf. And, and on the west, it's going to collect here. So imagine our solar panels were like that. As we chatted in my interview drive, it's something that I'm very fascinated about. And, and even just the structure of the leaf itself and the way in which it has that design pattern I find is exceptionally interesting. And also just the way in which it captures water. You can see that it's coming out at all different angles and using it as a funnel to capture, to capture water. So not only can we sit here with, with this design and learn about its efficiency within the natural world, we can learn about how it is related to, to the ecology of the elephants and how it produces good food for the elephants and nutrition. So it's good to understand the soil type and, and the types of trees that come into your area because that, of course, will de define the type of ecology that lives here, from elephants to lions to clipspringer to little tiny uh, bucks and geesbok and everything. So thanks. I, always, I really wanted to come say hello to the round leaf teak, and, and we've done so. I'm just going to put it down, and we're going to head back on the road. Um, hopefully we can find something a, you know, a little bit bigger, a little bit more interesting. Um, no, not that that's not interesting. I think that that is absolutely fascinating. But um, I'm excited to, to see if we can find any wilderness, uh, any large animals. And I'm also just trying to, to get used to the vehicle and the camera, as you, as you know, that I'm looking at a whole bunch of people and trying to understand the complexity of the vehicle and everything. So it's taking its time. But you know what? I'm glad that I have you to, to help me through this experience. <sighs> head off back through that. Have a look in the distance, everyone. Look how beautiful that looks. Green on e either side of the road. You can clearly see that it's been raining here over the last few weeks. And I mean, when I was here just a couple of weeks ago, it was raining. It hadn't rained in so long. And it's just incredible to see how quickly the, the bush can recover from such a, such a drought and such a very, very dry part of its life. And all that it, it has.
Hazır mı? Bol. Ayı bu. Ayı gel gel. Nasıl sigara? Ya Allah. Okay, thanks. You see anything down there, boy? You see anything down? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Thanks, my boy. When I was here a couple of years ago, I trained at London Lozi, and I got to know the Shangan culture and the culture of people here, and I fell in love with them. Um, really, really. Kind and loving people, and they really are really connected with them. And it's so great to be back here with these. With these so much life experience and understanding of the bush felt. You know, that's something that I always felt that I missed when I was a youngster. Is, is really learning about the natural world and living and being immersed in it. Because I really find that ever since I started studying ecology, I, I found that the natural world had always brought so much interest to me. And it gave me a relationship to the world. Anyway, I just realized that I haven't had my headpiece. In. So, Kirsty, I'm coming back to you. <laughs> Alec. Like. We're just doing a quick look down in the drainage line here. Sorry, you went black screen there. Um, Wendy is being very naughty. I'm just going to, I think you're actually going to be able to see these things. Oh, you can, you can see them from here, which means that <laughs> we drove past them when we came past here. Oh, we didn't come past here, it wasn't us. Uh, Sam and uh, Sam and Jandre, however, <laughs> within four meters of them and on their way out today. You'll be forgiven, of course, if this is first drive. Jean-Dre, the foot, will not be forgiven, especially as they were on his side of the car. So they're actually only four meters from the road. <laughs> Let me just call that in again, and then we'll go and see if we can't pick up on some Karula tracks that Jamie was following this morning. Stations, this pride of lions is actually viewable from a Vuba Road in the drainage line. There's space for two vehicles now. Yeah, really nice picture of them lying in sweet, dappled light. OK, that's enough of the lions for now. We'll come back here when it gets a little bit cooler, or Sam can come back when it gets a bit cooler, and we'll have a proper look at them as they get active for their night of hunting. I think we decided that they may have had a small meal last night, maybe an impala or something like that, and then they probably went hungry for the rest of the time. Right, we're going to head to the south now, uh, back down towards a little place called Ingwe Alley, where Jamie did have tracks of Karula this morning and also tracks of Tingana, seemingly finished his uh, consort with Tandi, also coming back north. So we might be lucky and pick them up sometime during the afternoon. I feel we've had a rather a blessed afternoon already. Elephants, lions, flowers, butterflies, impalas, buffalo, really quite an astonishing array. Oh, Trayvon, a very nice question from you about butterflies, and do they try to fly straight ever, and why do they seem to fly so erratically? I think you'll find that they seem to fly so erratically because they're so light. The slightest wind can affect the direction in which they're flying, and they have to adjust for that all the time. The fact that they are able to adjust for that absolutely blows my mind. I just can't believe that they have the skill and agility to be able to adapt to that kind of sort of delicate, uh, delicate changes that they must make in their wings to fly. But definitely some of them can fly in straight lines. In fact, I'd say most of them can. 
I mean, if you think of those great migrations of monarch butterflies uh, between in Central America, I think they go all the way into North America. Uh, they definitely must be flying in pretty straight lines for them to get that far. I suppose they're also smaller, and so it does mean that the wind will affect them less than it would, say, if we were uh, had great big butterfly wings attached to ourselves. Lovely, lovely afternoon, I must say. So we're going to head down, down sort of along the Mulwati drainage line, and then we'll head towards Treehouse Dam and see if we can find anything that way in the way of Karula tracks or Tingana tracks. The Styx Pride, everybody, is on Arethusa at the moment, three of them. Their cubs are not being sort of shown to the pride yet, so we know they do have cubs, but they haven't introduced them to the pride yet, and that means that uh, they're not really viewable yet. So I'm not going to leap across to Arethusa with great enthusiasm yet. We'll wait for the cubs to be introduced to the pride. We have our own lions here, of course, and soon they too will have little cubs. And it is my firm opinion that a lion cub is the cutest thing in the bush. I believe it to be cuter than a leopard cub. Now I know that will be, that will be, um, uh, th th that will to many of you be something of a, an irreligious statement. But yes, I'm afraid I do believe it to be true. I just still can't get over how green it has got since Brian and I went on our leave a little while back and how much thicker the bush is. You've really got to have a hard look into it. And of course, when Sam was here, we were doing that rain dance, that ridiculous uh, second, ra third rain dance, I think it was. And it seems to have worked. So I clearly am not very good at bringing the rain. Sam is very good at bringing the rain. So the next time a rain dance is required, um, you'll have to ask him, I think. Right, so Sam has a bird. Let's go and see what it is. Welcome back, everyone. Had a little blank screen earlier. So we're back now with a magpie shrike. And that's exciting for me because today I am going to be starting a bird list. And that is my very first bird in the bush. So thank you very much, Mr. Magpie Shrike, for being the first bird on my bird list. Um, I thought that it would be a really good idea if we could, you know, like work together, basically, at the beginning of my time here at Juma. I've, you know, was thinking of ways in which I can connect with my viewers. And, you know, since it's been a long time... Oh, there goes a little... Can you see the little mongoose? Can you see it? There was a little dwarf mongoose that ran across there. No, it left, it left. A sweet little dwarf mongoose just ran across the road. Um, but as I was saying, I would love to start a bird list with everyone um, because I haven't been here for a while and I would love to just begin to develop the list and see where we can go in the first, you know, the first cycle of my time here. So I'm going to write down in my little blue book, uh, where I've already written, written some notes when I was on James's drive this morning. I'm going to say number one, magpie shrike. Once again, I'm going to say if you would like to ask any questions or or like talk to talk to me about the bird what you know about the magpie shrike please you know turn it in and, and ask me and we can have a little chat um but on that let's let's carry on into into the beautiful wilderness and see what other beautiful birds we can see today my favorite bird is a black-headed oriole and i heard the black-headed oriole yesterday and i was very excited that gave me a great feeling so i would love to see that bird i mean it's my favorite bird within the, the Sabi Sands area. Um, so if we see that together, I'll be extremely excited. But my, my favorite bird overall is the black eagle, where I was just last week. I was sitting last week in the Cedarburg Mountains for my stepmother's 50th, uh, Michaela Strachan, who's also a presenter. She's a presenter for Spring Watch and Autumn Watch and Winter Watch in the UK. And, it was just incredible to, well, it is incredible to have a stepmother who's in the industry of presenting and is able to help me. 
What have you seen, Jean Ray? Mongoose. A mongoose? He's gone. He's gone. Jean Ray has got eyes like a owl. Seeing everything that I'm not seeing right now. But yes, let's continue on the on the bird hunt and see what we can find out there. Monique in London. Welcome to Safari Live. I'm, I'm pretty sure you've probably been here a few times more than me, but my favorite bird was the black eagle, but my favorite animal to view is probably the wild dog. I know a lot of people would say that, but I just have probably the, the most exciting experience I've ever had, um, you know, when viewing them on a vehicle because they're so interactive. And when you find wild dogs, it's super exciting. They, they're moving quickly and, you know, that, it was just that particular day, you know, I, I, I just arrived in the bush many years ago, or two years ago, and, and we were, myself and my best friend Donovan were running, no, not running, driving either side of each other, and these wild dogs were going crazy because they had just spotted Impala in the distance. And as you know, Impala won't stick around when they see a wild dog, they will run a good distance. That's a you know, cool fact to know, you know. You know, an impala, like I saw this morning with the, I think it was called the Inkuumus, if I said that right. I hope so. Inkuumus, thanks, Andre. Um, when I was, yeah, when I was sitting with them, the, the, the impala was standing there and they were making a noise. Bah! Can't really do it well, but it's a, it's a bark. And they bark at the lions to say, listen, I'm over here. You know, I can see you, I'm not gonna run away from you. And that's when the lions become a little bit, you know, they can't really attack when they realize that. But with the wild dogs, the wild dogs, cheap as they get, you know, they will go and the antelope will run a distance and wild dogs will chase them down. And so, you know, the chase is such an exciting experience to watch. And I'll never forget that day, it was actually 11 wild dogs and they all went in their separate directions. And then we found the pack a little bit later. It was 10 of them that we found just sitting there. And um, one of them was missing. There was 11 in the pack. And one of them was missing. I, I did, we didn't know where it was. And then eventually one of the rangers went on the other side. And they found, ooh, we've got a, I think we've got a buffalo over there. I'll see if I can get round. Um, they found a, he found one of the, the last wild dogs sitting there with the impala. And um, it hadn't started eating it. It had blood all over its face, but it didn't start eating. And it was incredible because you know, they, they, he didn't start eating it on his own. He waited for the pack and then they ate it together and they ate it very quickly together. So it was very exciting. But once again, to our left are the beautiful Dagger Boys, otherwise known as the Buffalo. Some of the, one of the most dangerous species to see on, on foot. I've had a few experiences with these, these animals when I was at foot, when I did my long walks at Londolozi, I definitely got, got my heart racing. But look how, look how nice and cool it looks in there. Eh? I just think, think back on one of those days where it's been so hot and you just went and you jumped in that ice cold pool and you felt so great with life. Eh? Can, you feel that, can you feel that they're feeling that? I feel that. They're having a nice little dip in the pool. Dip in the pool. But it really is incredible to be back here where the water's out and, and where they're all relaxing in this water. They, they looked really distressed when there was, when there was no water. And, and often buffalo can, you know, from what I've been told, the Inkuhumus are, are love the buffalo to eat. And, you know, when there's not much space for water, the old dagger boys are, you know, the ones that, that go, go because they become blind and they, and they're a lot more tired, and so the, it's a much easier kill for, for the lions. But what's, what's really interesting about buffaloes is that they, you know, they, as they get older, obviously there's herds. So you've seen the herds over time, and that's something I'm excited to see in the near future. But you can imagine in those herds, you know, they, these old, the old ones, you know, eventually get too old to stay with um, the herds, and, and so they, they go into the grassy, lushy areas where they can eat the, the grass, you know, because their teeth also become quite old. And so not only do they become blind, slow, and old, you know, they, 
they really just have a difficult time, and so that's why they're taken out by the by the lions. And, and that's the you know that's the scary thing when you're on foot and you come across one of those one of these old guys. It's really quite scary because sometimes the, it's better to to fight than flee for them because they can't run, so they will just run. So you, wherever you are, if you're going out into the bush, please be aware of the buffalo. You know they strong, powerful animals, even though they look like they've got that nice, cute little uh, horns. They, they can be quite vicious at times. But that's the, another beautiful sighting of the buffalo. Three sightings of swimming buffaloes. Well, not quite swimming, but relaxing, enjoying the afternoon swim. And they'll most probably s spend the rest of the afternoon here. Um, but while we Oh, we've had this sight. Oh, look at the little buff just down there. Can you see him? He's got a little ox picker on his back, and, and I think he's doing really well out of, out of the group of them because he's got the shade as well, so he's really looking after himself over there. But with that, I'm going to carry on into this thicket, into the wilderness, and I'm going to link you to James. See you later. There, everyone, is either a greater blue-eared glossy starling or a cape glossy starling. Now, if you listen very carefully, you can hear it, you can hear what it is. Of course, it has stopped speaking now. I'm going to play you the call of the cape glossy starling. I always remember this because it goes, it sounds to me like it's saying, cape glossy starling, cape glossy starling. Here it goes. See, Cape Glossy Starling. There we go. Cape Glossy Starling. All right, now, the other one that looks very similar, of course, to that is the Greater Blue-Eared Glossy Starling, and that one says, Blue, Blue. See, Blue. And that's how I remember the difference. Because if you see them sitting next to each other, they look almost completely identical unless you have them in this kind of light. Now, in this kind of light, what you can see behind the eye of that Cape Glossy Starling is the fact that it doesn't have a very obvious blue ear covert. There, that's a, he's perfectly showing it to us. You see, behind his eye, his head is a uniform blue-green color. And remember that that color that he's sort of shining there, is that turquoisey blue and green is not blue and green at all. It's a trick of the light played by specially placed uh, crystals of keratin and melanin within those feathers. So it absorbs all the other wavelengths except the green and blue ones, and that's why it looks green and blue. No pigment of green and blue in that bird at all, which I just find astonishing. And that is the Cape Glossy Starling. Now, Andrew is hailing me on the radio. I'm just going to quickly talk to him while we drive along. We haven't found any leopard tracks just yet. Go ahead, Andrew. I have left them, Andrew. If you just drive along the Bubu Road into the drainage line north of the dam, and you'll see them right there uh, in the drainage line on the uh, western side of the road. There we go. So I was just helping Andrew from Cheetah Plains, where we shall be going in the next few weeks. Can't wait for that. I'm just helping him into a sighting of those lions, which hopefully he will be able to find without quite the same effort that we took to find them. It's a slight letdown like that, where you go and you find them on foot and they're where you predicted they would be, and then you drive around on the road, and the easiest thing would have been just to drive along the road, and then you would have seen them. Now, Jamie had tracks of Karula heading in this sort of general direction today. If she was heading south, there were no tracks of her cubs this morning, so they're obviously not traveling with her just yet. But I suspect she probably would have continued south back to them. So we might get her sort of on the way there if she's killed, but I suspect she's probably gone across already. 
I just can't wait for her to bring them across and introduce them to us. And I think that she will do that simply because she's basically inside Tundi's territory at the moment. And it's going to be slightly awkward for her. They are related, of course, and that means that they will tolerate each other and they were unlikely to have a violent conflict. But I think she would like a bit of privacy, I'm sure, once those cubs are able to move. <laughs> magic, magic light here. And the sound you can hear is fork-tailed drongos having a little bit of a fight with each other. No, never mind, Brian. I think we'll make everybody very seasick if we try and track those things. Mmm, it's gone. It was a white brown scrub robin stopped right close to the road and we hear them all the time. So seldom see them. And it's the male that would be calling. He will be advertising himself so that he can attract ladies into his territory and frighten away potential rivals. Much the same reason for my playing my guitar. Hello, Jacob. You're a new viewer. Um, I'm just quickly turning the game drive radio. It's very lovely to have you with us. And you want to know if we are in South Africa's national park. Well, Jacob, South Africa has over 20 national parks. We are indeed in the biggest, though. And that is the iconic Kruger National Park, which is in the northeastern corner of South Africa. And that is part of a much bigger trans-frontier conservation area, which means it's an area, a conservation area, that extends across national boundaries. It goes east into Mozambique and north up into Zimbabwe, and it's called the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. So we are part of that. It's 8 million acres, Jacob, 8 million acres we're part of. We obviously can't traverse that all 8 million of those acres. We're traversing just 4,000 of them on the western fringes in South Africa. Thank you, Jacob. Please keep watching. And any other questions that anybody might have about South Africa, or indeed the continent of Africa, please feel free to send them through. There are lots and lots of misconceptions about this country. There are lots and lots of misconceptions about the continent. Um, and especially when we talk about the size of Africa. Africa, of course, is much, much bigger than the continental United States. And that means that it is extremely varied. So when people say, well, you know, I've been to Africa, it's like saying, well, I've been to North America or I've been to South America, which means you could have gone to Peru, you could have gone to Brazil or Argentina or Ecuador or Bolivia or Guyana or any of those other places, which are so totally distinct from each other. It's a magnificent continent. And we, of course, are in the mo most magnificent part of it, aren't we, Brian? Indeed. South Africa. <laughs> and we're now heading towards Treehouse Waterhole. And I think Sam has actually got a hippo to show you before we get to the water. Let's go and see. Hello, everyone. We are sitting here with a hippo. And I'm going to be completely honest with you, we drove on the other side of this dam earlier and I didn't see the hippo, I saw the, the four buffaloes. So there, in the middle, sits the beautiful hippo. And while I was here, everyone, I found a blacksmith plover. I wrote it down, but I am not going to write it down. I'm actually going to cross it out because I really actually want to experience it with you. So I'm going to cross out the blacksmith plover, which I saw. Um, but it's not real until you see it, I guess. Eh? Um, but here I am. I'm, I'm sitting by, by a hippo. And, you know, I just want to... My favorite... One of my favorite storytellers of the hippo... Oh, no, where's, where's it? Can you hear that? Oh, there it is. 
All right, guys, can you see the, the two blacksmith plovers that are on the other side? I literally just crossed it out. <laughs> I'm going to write it back on my list. You know what's awesome about a blacksmith plover is the way in which you can tell that it's a blacksmith plover is the way in which it uh, tinks. It sounds like it's hitting metal. Um, and that's the way in which my the trainee taught me how to learn the blacksmith plover. So whenever I'm walking in the bush and I hear that tink, 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 it's our old friend, the blacksmith plover. So here I go. Blacksmith plover. And something that I'm extremely, extremely fond of um, as we go back to the hippo, just in the middle of the dam here, is you know, storytelling. Something I really enjoy is storytelling. Storytelling in the past, you know, with the Bushmen, I, I, I studied up in the Cedarburg Mountains, and um, I learned about the way in which the Bushmen used to tell stories uh, to one another, and especially around the fire to the children. And that's the way in which they, you know, the way in which they learned about their wilderness, about their world, you know, about the relationship to the natural world is through storytelling. And, and I think it's, I think it'll be nice if I. On my first drive, I'd, I'd tell a little quick story about the hippo and how the hippo is in the water. Um, and it's actually my favorite story, and it's one story that I've said the most. If any of my friends are watching, they'll know I've said this story a few times. Um, but was, try and imagine this, OK? So the hippo, many, many, many years ago, never used to sit in the watering hole as it is at the moment. It actually used to be a land animal. But it got so hot. It used to walk around the savannah and be so hot. And it would secrete a little pink substance that would act as a sun cream. And it would literally hop from tree to tree in the shade to try and get away from the sun. It was having a very, very, very difficult time. And one day, the hippo decided to pluck up some courage and say, you know, I'm actually going to see if I can go to the watering go the water gods. Um, which, to my knowledge, is the, is, which is the otter, the kingfisher, and I think it's the fish eagle. But I can come back to you on that one. So he went up to the three, the three uh, water guards, and he said, please, 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 can I get out of the sun and into the water? Uh, and the guards looked at the hippo and said, you know, hippo, to be honest with you, you're quite a big dude, and lady dude. You know, you're a big hippo. And um, I don't think I can grant you the access to this water. You know, you're just going to eat all of the fish. I, I, we can't let you eat all the fish. What are we, what are we going to eat? And what is everything else going to eat? Are you going to destroy this ecology, this ecosystem? You know, so the hippo put down his head and he was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm so sad. And, you know, he looked really, really sad. And he looked up at the, at the watering gods and he just said, please, you know, I'm really struggling and I need your help. So the gods took pity on, on hippo and said, you know what, hippo, we'll, we'll grant you permission to go into the watering holes, but you are not allowed to eat any of the fish. And you, you see those canines that you have? They're big canines. One day when we have an opportunity to look at a hippo and see the canines, we can see that they have huge teeth. And you cannot eat any of the fish out there. You, you have to come out onto the land and eat grass. And to this day, the hippo now, you'll see it's in the watering hole at the moment. But at night time, the, watering, the hippo is going to come out of the watering hole and it's going to exit into, into the bush vault, and it's going to graze on grass. And to prove to the gods that the hippo no longer eats fish in the water, he sprays his dung on the floor to show the gods there are no fish bones in his poo. So that is a little story of the hippo. And that, that's something that during my time here at, at uh, Wild Earth, I would love to tell you more stories about, you know, everything that's here because that's you know that was an interest of mine during my masters i was studying about the relationship of the natural world and how uh, you know the bushmen used to have such a deep relationship i mean they used to talk about you know light, lightning and thunder as two two brothers quarreling um, so it's a magical way to see see wildlife and through those through that story i told you you would have learned some very important things like from the fact that Hippos excrete a pink stub substance on their body to protect them from the harmful rays of the sun, um, to the fact that they spray their dung on the floor and they go out at night time. So storytelling within education is actually quite important because it, you know, it 
not only tells and engages an audience, but it also emits a very, very pertinent education on people. So, that was the story of the hippo. We've seen a blacksmith plover, seen a hippo, we've seen some buffaloes. Simon! Simon, thank you very much indeed for bringing me into clarity of the oxpecker. Of course, there are oxpeck, oxpeckers in the distance there that are going to be eating the parasites off the buffalo. I think I even mentioned it earlier. Um, so thank you, Simon, for, for updating me. I'm going to put that into my book, ASAP. Right, the sun is dwindling its way down into the low fault, and I want to see if I can find some other animals out there. Twitter um, explains that, you know, apparently that the Africa are from hippos, and Roy, you are completely true on that one. Um, hippos are very, 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 very dangerous animals when you are on foot, especially when they are outside of the water. If you are walking on foot, and you come across a hippo, and you are standing in between the water and where the hippo is, sometimes that hippo will charge you towards the water and that's when it gets really, really, really dangerous to be. And actually a really, really good friend of mine, um, when I started training, trained at Londolos, he got injured by, by that exact thing. You know? The hippo came and, and hurt her quite badly. So, yes, yeah, so we have to be very, 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 very aware of the hippo out in the, in the bush fault. Great question. Thank you, Roy. in front of us we can see that we've got some elephant dung. It's always a good sign that we might be able to see some ellies. Um, I would actually love to see some elephants out in the bush fault on my first drive here in the Sabi Sands. They're always an exciting animal to watch as they move around the bush fault heavily. But if we listen clearly, sometimes we can actually hear the sound of the ellies walking through the bush fault. as I rumble through the bush fault. I'm going to link you back to James. I'll see you just now. Hopefully we've got some more birds to our list. Okay, we've checked Treehouse Dam. Unfortunately, we found nothing there except, Brian, a... Terrapin. And? A bird. And what was that bird, Brian? It was a dove. Ah, on it. What kind of dove, Brian? It was an emerald spotted Oh, dove. not in the macro dove then. No, why okay. would you think in the macro dove, James? <laughs> I can't imagine, Brian. Brian said, ooh, there's in the macro dove. Uh, I said, are you sure? sure? Trying to throw me under the bus, James. Are you sure it was in the macro dove? It's not impossible, of course. Could well have been. Now, we've come along here in order to find some leopard tracks. We've found no such thing. Now, that is encouraging in one respect, simply because it means that perhaps that Karula is around here somewhere on the kill, or that we've just missed the tracks. That's equally possible. But let's drive to the far eastern sector here, western sector, and see what we can pick up. Um, I'm also quite hopeful. Now, you know, Shadow has kept, stashed her cubs in a ridiculously stupid place uh, on a culvert on the main sort of access road. But it's not far from our western boundary, and I know that she was seen going off on a hunting foray a few nights ago. And so with any luck, we might be able to see her doing the same again. Sam has uh, found something else to show you. Welcome back, everyone. 
I'm going to talk in a softer voice because I don't want to make too much of a noise when I'm sitting here with the butterfly. Um, I just think it's um, not that it's going to fly away if I talk too loudly, but I just would like to keep it down when I'm among such delicate, beautiful animal or butterflies. And what we have in front of us here is a blue pansy. It's actually the same butterfly that I saw this morning with, with James. It's such an incredible butterfly. And, I loved learning um, about, you know, you know, how those little balls on that you can see on the butterfly actually act as a, as you know, camouflage for for a butterfly and sh trying to show predators that it might be eyes. I think that's fascinating. You know, animals are and plants are always trying to adapt to their environments and trying to to, you know, connect to the bush in such a way that it can become resilient. And so it's it's amazing how creatures. You know, form the ability to to adapt to the landscapes, and I really admire admire them, and and I often think about what how I would adapt to a landscape if I was stripped of all the things that I had, and how I would adapt. So you're a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Thank you for being the first butterfly that I had on the show. I will never forget you, Blue Pansy, forever. John Ray thinks that's quite funny. Thanks, Andre. We're going to carry on. Um, hello. Hello, Judas in Canada. The question was, I'm just going to take this off. The question was, how do I spell my surname? Well, you spell my surname with a C, and then an H, and then an E. And then a V, an A, and an L, and an L, and an I, and an E, and an R. C H E V A double L I E R. Chevalier. Which actually means a knight, a French knight. So, or a black knight. Um, so that's my surname. My second name is Barrington. So my full name is Samuel Barrington Chevalier. some tracks. Do you know what would make me so excited is if we could see a leopard. I still haven't seen a leopard since I've been here. I came in my interview and I thought we found tracks, myself and Scott, who, you know, if Scott's watching, I don't know if he is, but I just want to say thank you to Scott, who made my interview a lot easier and also a lot of fun, really. You helped me relax and you helped me enjoy the bushveld for what it really is and how I could actually try and share it with the viewers. Wow. So I didn't see a leopard when I was here last time. And yeah, as I said with Scott, I was we were looking through through the drainage line to see if we could find one, and um, didn't manage to see one. But maybe this afternoon, if I look hard enough, and hopefully you guys can also look through the screen to see if you can see anything moving in in front of us. But ways in which we can find leopard is is not only through looking for tracks, I and mean, that's that's one way. Sometimes we bump the leopard. And uh, ooh, we've got a bird there. I think that those were the, 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 the helmet strikes. What do you think, Jean-Rod? Did you see them? Ooh, and there's a Franklin. Cheapest. Sorry, everyone. Got in your way. Still trying to learn the tricks of getting away from the camera when I need to. And I just did that as I said that. <laughs> So what we just saw over here was a crested Franklin, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm not correct, which is another list that we can write here, the name to our list. And they make an incredibly loud sound, the crested Franklin. You might have heard it as we drove close to it now, the crested Franklin. 
often with a with a crested franklin you'll see it moving on the road in front of us sometimes you drive and they just follow your your vehicle in front of you and they don't move and then you stop and you wait for them and sometimes they don't move it's it's quite hilarious but thank you very much crested franklin for bra in showing us your presence <laughs> As I was saying, uh, on the subject of birds and leopards, you know, leopards don't only get found through tracking. We can also find leopards through birds. So birds will sometimes alarm call at a leopard, and that will be a sign to tell us that maybe there's a leopard in the area. At the same time, you can also hear the, the alarm call of squirrels. Squirrels will make a rem remarkably loud call, and that can sometimes show that there's a leopard. Sometimes it's, it can be a snake, like a black mumbo, that gets in the way and makes a very, very loud sound. Um, but that's something that we've got to try and listen for. Perfect timing. We're going to, myself and jean are going to slowly creep through the wilderness here. And, um, and we're going to listen out for any bird calls that are alarm calling. And you're going to see what James is up to, so I'll see you just now. Hello, everybody. You find me in the uh, puddle that used to be the home of Pinchy Winer. And I got in here because Brian said that he saw something scuttling. Now, Pinchy Winer, for those of you who are new viewers, is a freshwater crab, or was a freshwater, freshwater crab that lived in this hole over here. And what I did was, it was, turned out to be a wolf spider, not a crab. And so I re-excavated his hole for him. I found it and used this stick to dig it out. And I'm hoping, you know, there's actually quite a bit of... Rio's breaking a bit. Oops. There's quite a bit of uh, metabolic heat coming out of this hole. So. Maybe he's still in there, and maybe he's still alive. But I can't see him down there. Anyway, we've opened it up, and with any luck, Pinchy Weiner will live again sometime soon. Good luck, Pinchy. He's going to try and put a bug in there just to sort of help him through the tough times, uh, but I decided not to. Mainly because you came across to have a look what I was doing, and I knew that some of you would feel sorry for the bug that I fed to Pinchy Weiner. <laughs> Pinchy Weiner, of course, is the best name that a crab has ever had. Named after Mark Weiner, a great naturalist of the Wild Earth era. How's that? It's quite a nice, uh, nice way of putting it, don't you think, Brian? The Wild Earth era. Makes you feel part of something big, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, I haven't plugged myself in yet. Hang on. So many wires everywhere. Oh dear, I think I've lost this one. There we go. Uh, yeah, I'm back in. No sign of shadow either. So we're going to drive back down, sort of towards the area where Jamie had the last tracks, but tracking this time of the day, not hugely successful. So we'll just see what else we can find. Hello, Ellen in Arkansas, an interesting one. Of course, uh, Shadow, who's got cubs, it's Karuna's daughter, and she lives right next to, they've got territories adjacent to each other. And Ellen, you want to know if they were to meet each other with their cubs, uh, would they avoid each other? Would they fight to the death? What would happen? Because they're related, it's highly unlikely that there would be a physical confrontation. There may well be some growling and some angry talk, and then I think they'd split apart and go away from each other. It's not impossible, though, um, that they might share a kill, sort of by default, if it's close to the boundary. And I know of an example of a female leopard adopting a cub from her daughter, which was absolutely amazing to see. That was at Londolozi. Three, four female had lost one of her cubs, and she was still lactating. Her daughter also had cubs, and she basically just adopted one of them. So 
you know, you, you'll never read about that in a textbook because they'll tell you it's impossible, but anything can happen. I think it's highly unlikely that they would fight each other, though, especially not uh, to the point that they did each other damage. Thank you, Ellen, for that. The sun is starting to set, and so what I think we're going to do, rather than hang around too much in this area hoping for a leopard sighting, I think we should probably head off towards Brian. The hyena den. Yes, the hyena den. Because I have yet to see my favorite friends out here since my return from leave. Brian, have you seen them? No. No, not at all. So we're going to go off towards Aubrey's Road and see if the hyena den is active. It was this morning. Uh, well, that was until we went that way and then we didn't find anything. Well, we didn't go there. I think, uh, I think Jamie went to have a look there this morning. I don't think there was anything around. There is an impala ram. Hello, Mr. Impala. Of course, the impala starting to spend more and more time alone. Uh, Jamie didn't go to the hyena den this morning, but I do know that it was active because Taxon definitely went. There he goes. These rams no longer friends to each other as their testosterone levels go through the roof and they fight over mating opportunities and the chance for a territory. There he goes. Not so fearful on their own anymore. And that's just simply bravado brought on by an increased testosterone. And that testosterone increase, interestingly, there's a fairly fresh track of a male leopard here. Hmm. Let's just go a little bit further forward. I don't really want to waste these tracks. There they are. Can you see them there, Brian? Yeah. And let me see if I can do one of these tricks. There, yeah, there we go. There. You can see there is the male leopard track distinct from the females just by the size, but this is not a very big male leopard track. It might actually be... No, it is a male. Okay, what we're going to do, we're still going to head to the hyena den, but I'm just going to take a slightly different route. I didn't see these tracks on the last road we were on, so I'm guessing that they probably went into... This might be a female that's running, you know, they don't... They don't look very big. As we know, there are no young males around. I'm pretty sure this is a male. Okay, so we're just gonna do a slight detour. Obviously not close to here, otherwise that impala, well, it might be in imminent danger of dying as we speak, but I can't think so. I think a leopard probably went through there. Didn't see it on the road over here. So we'll just take a slightly different route down towards the hyena den. Yeah, it's not here. It's not here. Hello, Vera, you're in Ohio, and you want to know, would, will Charula leave her cubs in the den alone? Yes, she will. Definitely, she has to. She has to go and hunt. And these days, of course, they're now two months old, so she might just leave them climbing in a tree, actually. They're old enough to get away from potential predators at the moment. Don't see any further tracks, I must say. Okay. We'll just drive down this road. I suspect that whoever it is has gone off in here. It might pop, off, pop out onto the road again. But like I say, tracking in this light, as the light starts to finish, is, uh, well, it's just very difficult. Beautiful smells all over the place, from the flowers and the herbs, the aniseed, the basil, all wild versions thereof. And Brent says to me that you can eat that wild aniseed. Yep. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Hello, Zoe, on Twitter. Um, you want to know about 
any interesting animal sightings I may have had while I was on my leave. Uh, the only interesting animals I saw were domestic stock. A couple of cattle, a few goats, a donkey or two, a horse, two dogs, and I don't think I saw a cat. No, I didn't see a cat. <laughs> but no other animal sightings. I went basically to Johannesburg and well, Johannesburg and some of the areas in the panorama, which are in the mountains around here, and not a huge number of uh, sort of wild animals in those areas. Brian, are you all right there? Oh, are you bleeding? Not yet. Not bleeding yet, everybody. Watch out. Andrew says that the hyena den is active, so we're going to head there quite quickly. Hello, Heidi in Switzerland. I love the fact that we have a Heidi from Switzerland watching us. Very appropriate name, of course. And Heidi, you want to know that the hyena den is the same one as before. It's one of the same ones as before, yes. It's the Aubrey's Road den. I think it's relatively new. I don't think it's been used before this year. Or maybe early last year it was used. But, no, in fact, it definitely wasn't. It's early this year that they started using it, but they have abandoned it and then re uh, sort of gone back to it. So it is its, at least its second usage. They may have used it a couple of years before that, but not since I've been here have they used it before this year. But you are correct. I mean, lots of the den sites that they have around here, they reuse quite regularly. And I know of one, two... Three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven den sites of these hyenas. And that's just one little clan, and it's not a very big clan either. So we'll head towards them now. What usually happens is now that the female or the adults will go foraging basically as the sun sets it's, sets, it's amazing. As the sun goes down, they make their little calls, the youngsters go back into the burrows after they've been feeding, and then the adults go off and try and find something to eat for the night. Because whatever Brian is sneezing at is definitely getting into my nose as well now, I must say. I wonder what it is. I suspect quite strongly it's pollen. Ooh, just quickly, this is quite fun. That rock in the road, can you see it there? How do you think that got there, everyone? Hey, you had the same sighting with Jamie the other day, okay. Well, I'll tell you then. It was probably put there by an elephant. And the elephants, I've seen an elephant pick a rock up. I often used to find them on the road and think, how on earth did that get there? And well, I saw an elephant then one day pick up a rock, walk around with it, put it down, have something to eat, pick it up again, and then put it down in the middle of a road. So elephants do that sort of thing. I'm sorry that that's a second-hand sighting that you've had there. Ooh, Brian, I've got just the thing for our allergies, I do. I don't know if it actually helps allergies, but we're going to eat them anyway. Delicious. Delicious, delicious. White berries, Brian. White berries. Oh, oh yes. Mm. <laughs> not that delicious. And <laughs> <laughs> not quite ripe. So we'll just take a few. The whiter they are, the riper they are. There you are, Brian. I'll give you the three ripest ones. Yeah, thank you. Or oh, you just sabotaged me. No, I haven't. <laughs> so that's what they look like. And they will, they're pale, sort of minty green at the moment, but they will go white. Mm. Hence, white berry bush, but they're quite sweet. Mm. They've just got a slightly bitter aftertaste mm. when they're not quite ripe. Here's a really ripe one. These ones, and of course the guaris, are coming into fruit now. Mm, that was a good one. It tastes a bit like sweet peas. Mmm, the white berry bush. 
exists. Okay. Let's move a little bit quicker. And your energy's gone, Brian. Immediately. Instantly. Instantly. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. across to Sam. We're going to drive a little bit quicker to get to the den before the sun sets. I'll see you there. Hello. We are here with an old friend of mine. Well, I wouldn't call it a friend. I mean, it would be more of a foe if I consumed it or did anything silly like that. It is it's called the poison apple, or otherwise known as the la night lampshade. Um, Oh, it was amazing. I, I haven't seen this flower in so long, and I just came into my sight, and I saw it, and I just remembered it straight away, which I'm just quite excited about because I thought I'd, you know, forget quite a lot of the bush felt, and it's just incredible to have a look at the poison apple. And, you know, what's actually poisonous about the, uh, about the plants is not actually the flower itself, but it's actually the two, the berries that it, it has. It's the greenish berries, if I remember correctly, greenish yellow. And if you consume those, they can be toxic to us. So, if you're in the bush felt and you look like you can see a, a berry that you want to eat and it's got poison nightshade over here, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, depending on how my time goes out here, who knows, someone in camp might get... <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking, you won't get a berry in your meal. I'll be very nice to everyone because you guys have been incredible to me. So, thank you. But here we are, and we're going to carry on. Just to the west of us is a beautiful sunset that's going on. Um, it's been a long time since I've been back in the bush felt, and so to see this sunset is making me extremely, extremely excited. I'm just going to pop on my earpiece, and we can get on the goings. I haven't seen any other birds since we were last year. I was actually just sitting with this beautiful flower since I've been here. And um, yes, I must say that I'm, I'm, I love my flowers. Um, you know, from the string of stars to, I think it's called the foxglove. And I'll never forget when I was in the wild sesame. I was just, just, so, just so blown away by the, the beauty that this, um, the bush felt can create, especially in the in the driest of times. Um, something I think it's called the impala lily, which comes out uh, towards towards winter, which is a clear sign that winter's coming. I think that's correct. Um, so hopefully we'll be start seeing the the impala lily. But oh, guys, this is great. Have a look to the west. Have a look at that sunset. I'm actually just going to switch off the car. Look at that, everyone. In these moments, I just, you And just in front of that beautiful sunset is a warthog. Hello. So once again, it's been a great introduction back into Wild Earth TV. You know, I must say I was very nervous as I came back and how I would react in front of camera again. Because it's not, it's, it really isn't nothing like the live safari, and it's just, you know, it's so, you know, when you're on live TV, it's so, you actually just get an energy. And I feel very energized being in front of the camera. And to sit here and, and look at this beautiful sunset with all of you and this, this beautiful warthog in front of us is great. You know, something that I truly believe in is, is shared experiences. I was, just last week, I, I I was with my twin brother, his name's Thomas, Thomas Chevalier, and he is in Cape Town, and, and we were planting with a, a whole bunch of friends of ours, uh, a community garden just outside Cape Town, a uh, vegetable garden. And um, we did it with the local community, and we did it with, with friends of ours and, and, you know, the little kids from the community, and it was so incredible because we did something in our country. As you know, I think South Africa is going through quite a hard time politically and and, um, and so of course that's having social issues but it's just so amazing to immerse yourself within the optimism 
of, of this country. And when you have shared experiences where you got your hands in the soil and you're connecting with people, it, it really brings, you know, it, at least it brings me together with people. And when you have something in common with someone, you, you get to know them better. So the fact that I'm sharing, you know, my experience here with the natural world with you brings commonality and, and the more connected our community of people are becoming around the world and the more aware we are becoming of the natural environment. And it's crucial, especially now that we've become more aware of this, this beautiful paradise that exists around us and this earth that is it's just so incredible and that we are alive. I mean, the stars, the sun, the sunsets, the warthogs, we're all enjoying this incredible life on earth. I just, I love it so much. With that, a beautiful sunset. And, um, and genre is great photography, or videography, sorry, not photography. Uh, we're gonna carry on into the sunset and we're gonna see what other birds we might be able to to see on the, the rest of the drive. Red build, or was it red build or yellow build? I know it's a hornbill. We've got two more in front of us. Looks like a red build. Yeah, uh, red build hornbill. I'm gonna write that down quickly. While I write that down, Monique in London is asking me whether, you know, if there's any other uh, types of, I think it was herbs? Was it herbs in the bush or, or, or like wild basil? I think it's wild basil that you said um, here. And to be honest, I actually don't know. Monique, I'm not sure if there is a wild basil. I think maybe, uh, Someone else has spoken to you. Oh, Jandre, Jandre is nodding his head at me. So there is such a thing as wild basil. So I'm excited to see that when we see it on drive. I'm going to ask Jandre to point it out, and then we can have a look at the, the wild basil together. But I'm just thinking back of my, of my time in the Cedarburg, and there was actually a wild rosemary in the in the uh, in the Cedarburg, which is just north of Cape Town. I'm sorry, I didn't explain where that was. The Cedarburg is where I lived for a couple of months, just north of Cape Town. It's home to the Cape Leopard and the Black Eagle, which are a vulnerable species at the moment. And um, ah, I enjoyed my time up there, living up there, learning about that ecology. Completely different environment out there. Beautiful mountains. Oh, that goes a great shot of a hornbill. Wow. That's a great shot of that hornbill, everyone. That's with the Beautiful sunset in the distance there. Fantastic evening drive. What a welcome to Safari Live. What a welcome. Extraordinary. Amazing. Thanks, guys. That's great. I really enjoyed that. That's a full sighting of the hornbill. But just going back to, to uh, the Cedarburg. Cedarburg is an incredible landscape, very harsh landscape that is, is home to succulent plants as well as the, the plants from the Protea family, from the, you know, the Fainbos, which is the, the Cape Town um, type of plants. So, and, and so it's a, a mixture between Karoo and Fainbos. And um, you'll find many, many different species of plants there, from Erica to Restios. Uh, that, that is where you know, I learned so much about plants. They're very, very passionate about learning about plants and it was incredible there. And in the Cedarburg was the, was the wild rosemary, which you could otherwise known in Afrikaans as the cotton, cotton boss. And um, you used to be able to crush the cotton boss, otherwise wild rosemary, onto meat. And you cook that on, on a braai, otherwise known as a barbecue in Australia, or just a, I don't know what you would call it in America, a barbecue. Yeah, thanks, Andre. And uh, yeah, so wild rosemary is something that I quite enjoyed when I had supper in the Cedarburg Mountains. Wow. Zero in Ohio asked me, does South Africa have a national flower? Yes, I think, I'm pretty sure they have a, a, a national flower. From what I understand, uh, 
is the, you know, from in the Cape is the Protea. The Protea is our national fly flower. And if you are a cricket supporter, which I highly doubt if you're from America, you'll understand that the Proteas is a cricket team. We call them the Proteas. And there are, ooh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to head this way towards the sun um, as I'm enjoying the sunset a lot. Um, so yes, the Protea is our national flower. And in Cape Town, you can find many, many different species of Protea. They're incredible, incredible. Some of them are really thick, some of them are thin, and um, they, you know, home to the, the Cape sugar bird. The Cape sugar bird love the Proteas, and especially the Ericas. So what, what the famous biome is, is cons consists of is three different types. It's the, the Restios, the Proteas, and the Ericas. And the Ericas are long tubular type of um, flower that sunbirds love to drink from. It's got a perfect shape for the sunbird to put its beak inside and, and drink the nectar or the pollen inside of the, the plant. So that's our national flower, the Protea. That's where I'm from. Okay, go and see James with the hyenas. I'll spot you a bit later. Hi everybody, we've made it to the hyena den and look what's happening here. It's just my favorite. The two little babies of Madam have grown immeasurably in the last two weeks. And that's their mother there, the matriarch of this clan of ours that has provided us with, with such joy over the last little while. With their torn up ears, and you can see why her ears are torn up. And these are her two little ones who are now, well, they're just, about, just over three months old now. Is that correct, Brian? Yes, it is. Mm. They're born in January, early January, and they've lost that black color completely. Now, at this stage of a leopard or a lion's life, basically they have weaned. These hyenas have got at least another three months worth of weaning to do, and they'll sp <laughs> spend some time at the den until they get to that age. I think it's just too sweet. And in the background, you won't be able to see this, and I can't actually move any closer, but it looks to me like Corky and her other two, the other side. Hello, Michael. There is Corky, I think, with her two little ones. Is it Corky? Ooh, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. That looks like Madam with those torn up ears. Oh, I can't see what's going on here. Let me just get out these powerful binoculars and have a look see. These are definitely the little ones. The best way, of course, will be to see if one of these little ones has got a little white patch on its back right foot. That one doesn't. Or is it back left? I think it's back left. They're both showing us their back right feet. That's interesting, because that, that other female there who's suckling a cub has got the torn ears of Madame, the matriarch, but I don't think that she's got little... Oh, no, it is corky. It is corky with a torn ear. I think I can see the top of her head. It's got those scars on it. So I'm pretty sure that's corky. Anyway, so the question I think from Michael about whether they are more closely related to cats or dogs, and many of our experienced viewers will tell you that despite the fact that they look like dogs, they are in fact much more closely related to the cats. And there we go, look. Who are you now? That must be one of the Novembers. Gosh, they have grown, gee whiz. I'm pretty sure that's a November youngster. This is wonderful there. Now let's just look and see if there's that white patch. If that white patch has persisted. I can't see it, can you, Brian? No. It's interesting. So, for those of you who are new viewers, one of these two little ones had a white patch on the left rear foot. 
and that made it very easy to see which one was which. I mean, I may have got all my identifications completely screwy, given that I've been away for the last little while. I don't think I have. And Miss Kirsty says she can't tell anymore. I'm struggling to tell as well. There's a little bit of white there. No, that's the wrong foot. Come on, turn around. That's a little female. That's interesting. Okay, so that's a little female, so that must be... That must be the one with the white patch. That must be... No, it's not. There's no white patch there anymore. Maybe the white patch has disappeared. Yeah. So thank you, Crystal, very much for your update. Corky, you say, is missing the tip of her left ear, which the hyena in the background is, and Madam has got two notches in her left and one in her right. And that seems to be the case here, so I'm pretty sure I've got it right. But what is interesting is that the that white patch that was on the back end of one of these little hyenas seems to have, well, kind of grown over. We'll only be able to tell that for sure when the other little one comes along. The other way to tell, of course, that this is Madame the Matriarch, well, not that one, but that is the daughter of Madame the Matriarch, now tripping over a piece of stick. There you can see the two notches in her left ear. Very nice. Thank you for that crystal. That's brilliant. And the other way to tell, of course, is that she is tremendously patient with all the other cubs. And Corky often isn't. She does seem to be being pretty patient now. But isn't this a wonderful den now with all this chlorous grass? All that chlorous Roxburghiana, it's called. It's just a really marvellous place to live, I think, if you happen to be a hyena. And that's a Cokie Franklin you can hear in the background. Some red-faced mouse birds. So nice to be back here, I must say. There's the other little one, through the claw's grass. Mm. Oh, if only I had a great big long lens like Brent Lear Smith's, I'd take an award-winning photograph now. There. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Alas, every time it's come to investing in camera equipment, I've gone for guitars instead. Mm. This is wonderful. Uh, James Richard, of course, I've lost my mind completely. You're absolutely correct. So... <laughs> These are the January Cubs, you're correct, and it was the December ones, D1 and D2, one of which had the white patch. Yes, thank you. I've lost my mind. That's exactly correct. So, the female December Cub, I think there was a male and a female, D1 had the left rear foot with a little white patch, and D2 had normal feet, and is, I think, a male. And I think this is maybe the first I thought initially when I saw these two youngsters, the two January cubs, when I saw them, I thought they were both males. But I think that that one we just saw with her, if it is a she, with her pseudo penis extended, I think that that is a female. You saw it was very straight on the end. It wasn't pinched. Thank you, James, for clearing that up. I thought I'd gone mad. This is just great.
pretty nightmare you want to know where June is. A pretty nightmare, I'm afraid. I can't tell you. I've got no idea where June is at this stage. But remember, June is now almost a year old. Now, from eight months, they will start to move away from the den, and they will go foraging with the adults. And although June may well come back here every so often to spend some time, she will be largely independent of the den now. And a few mornings ago, we saw two hyenas, not too far from here, but they were kind of lurking under a bush. Two young hyenas. Could have been two males. June, I think, is a male. And could well have been her or him there. Of course, June is a girl's name, but not in the hyena world. Now, of course, as we approach June 2017, at least 16, we're going to have to think about renaming these animals or just adding the year as well to their names. So, right, Sam's got a little beautiful shot of the western horizon to show you. Let's go and have a look there. Those colours in the distance are remarkable. From a white to a blue to a yellow to a golden, all meshed up in one beautiful sunset. I'm sure we might be able to see some red as the evening progresses, or maybe we just left the red. I'm not too sure. But just to the right of us, over here, we have a very old friend of mine called the Silver Cluster Leaf otherwise known as the Terminalia sorensis. I think that's right, Term Terminalia sorensis. And um, while we're looking here at this silver cl cluster leaf, you can see that there's all sorts of things happening. When you first sit it with, an echo with a system, you, all you're going to see is the tree, but we have a little bit clo a closer look. You can see these little ants walking around, and you know, it's incredible when you stop to look at, at, at organisms, organisms in the natural world, especially plants, you begin to see the life and the activity that exists around it and how they move around and how they work together and how they work as a system and they decentralize their work. I mean, if we looked at this silver cluster leaf a little bit longer, we'd get to know it a bit better and we'd understand maybe there'd be other bugs that come and eat the silver cluster leaf, specific bugs, you know. So here, yeah, as you know, as I started, you know, with the story of the silver cluster leaf, I, and I first want to say that you know, what's incredible about a silver cluster leaf is that you know, there's two types of defences really with plants. You get the mechanical defence, which you'll find in a buffalo thorn. Buffalo thorn you'll see is is hooked, and you, when you're walking in the bush, you'll often feel the buffalo thorn, and that's a you know, it's a mechanical defence defending the tree. Other plants, such as a silver cluster leaf, has a chemical defense. And that chemical defense is tannins. And in the leaf are a whole bunch of tannins that then, when the animals eat it, it dries their mouth out completely. So when I never met the silver cluster leaf, I didn't know that it, that was its defense. And what actually was happening when I first met silver cluster leaf, I was out in the middle of the savannah and we were doing a drill with rifles. Uh, when I was learning my rifles um, at Londolosi, and I, I sat and I was so nervous about you know doing this drill that I started chewing on a plant. And so I started chewing on the silver cluster leaf right before I went and did my drill, and my mouth just started going all tangy and dry, <laughs> and it just it I still did the drill fine, but my mouth was so 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 dry. So it's incredible to learn about these little defenses and the way in which the intricate ecosystem or how the plants work in the ecosystem to survive. And with that, we're going to carry on through the sunset. We're going to link back to Jam. See you just now. That's my head in the way, everybody, but we're still here with a magnificent hyena den. Madam has sat up, and as I said, the sun has just gone down, so chances are that she's going to go foraging fairly soon. Let me just get out of the way. <laughs> she 
he really does have a slightly, um, well, um, not bedraggled, but a severe look about her, I think. You know, it's no, no wonder that she is the matriarch of this clan. She looks quite old as well. She likes that little hole to sit in. <laughs> it's her favourite sofa. <laughs> Brian is being attacked by mosquitoes at the moment. He's really having a rough time of it. Mosquitoes, allergens, histamines. Sorry, Brian, I'm going to, what I'm going to ask you to do before you zoom in on the cubs there, can you zoom in on the rear end of the madam, just because it'll give us a nice idea of exactly what goes on there. So I know it can be extremely confusing as to what happens with a sort of hyena's sexual organs, but basically that arrangement there is known as the false scrotum, and that's why it looks like they've got testicles, the hyena females very different from any other mammal that you'll ever see. It is really quite astonishing. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's go across to the youngsters that are now playing in the grass. Chewing things, pulling things from each other. In amongst the Chlorus roxbergiana, the feathered Chlorus, I think it's called. Chewing, chewing, chewing. They have to chew, of course, because those muscles that are developing in their necks and up into their heads are so powerful and so important to their existence. The only jaws out here other than a crocodile's that can and do regularly crush bone to suck out the fat rich marrow. Norm, thank you for this question. Uh, thank you for two reasons. Firstly, thank you slightly sarcastically for asking me a question that I don't know how to answer. And secondly, thank you in all seriousness, because I don't know how to answer it, it's going to have an interesting discussion point. You want to know how similar this hyena is to the North American Ice Age hyena, is that correct? Or North European Ice Age hyena? The answer is that I don't know, Norm, except to say that I'm pretty sure that they would have belonged to the same family. So that is the family of the hyena day. And I know throughout the world there were hyenas distributed before the last ice age. They even went into Australia, I think. It, there were some giant hyenas found there, uh, very large hyenas. And they would all have been sort of relatively closely related. So more closely related than these hyenas are to cats or dogs or mongoose, but probably more distantly related than they are to, say, brown hyenas or striped hyenas or the artfark. So those that went extinct a long time ago would have shared a common ancestor um, with would have shared a common ancestor with these hyenas many millions of years ago, probably up to two or three million years ago. But their common ancestor with those hyenas would have been more closely or more recent than the common ancestor between dogs and cats and hyenas. So I hope that answers your question. It's a good one. And all over the world, of course, we were chatting this morning about how lions used to be the most widely distributed land mammal in the world, well, next to human beings, up to about 10,000 years ago. And all over the world, there were big cats all over the world, there were different species of hyena, different species of tiger, those saber-toothed cats, more than just the saber-toothed tiger that we all know of, but lots and lots of different kinds of saber-toothed cats, and of course, one of the most famous, not predators, but prehistoric animals that looks like an animal from Africa is the woolly mammoth. And I know I've told this story before, but it was a while back, the most ridiculous question I was ever asked now, they do say, I do say often that there is no such thing as a stupid question. This cert question certainly pushed the boundaries. I was driving along one day uh, on the safari, and a guest tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, 
Do you still get woolly mammoths here? And, of course, woolly mammoths have been extinct for probably at least 20, 10 or 20,000 years, maybe not quite, yeah, 10 or 20,000 years. I said uh, to her, I turned around and looked at her, now she was from South Africa, so she really had no excuse not to know better. And I said, um, not for some time, no. There is D, two, probably, playing with January one or two. I haven't seen the little white foot yet, and I think that the white-footed female is probably still suckling. And while this is quite sweet behavior, of course, it does have an element of seriousness to it. Of course, those um, youngsters being born to the matriarch will eventually be much more dominant members of this clan. And so, although they are playing with a larger and slightly less dominant hyena, this is informing the hierarchy. Now, European roller, used, I've asked along the lines of this hierarchy that is being sort of reaffirmed now, would the, a change in the hierarchy prove fatal to the alpha female? Well, not so much it would prove fatal, it would only happen if uh, the matriarch was to die. So when she dies, or when she becomes very weak, the matriarchy will be assumed by her oldest daughter. And that's basically how it works. It's <laughs> so sweet. It's based purely on hereditary title. And I think it's very unusual, and I haven't read of any examples where a hyena hierarchy is taken over by an un a bloodline unrelated to the matriarch. So normally her oldest or largest daughter will take over from her when she dies. It's very seldom that she would be killed in a kind of forced violent takeover. Although I can't believe it doesn't happen. So although I've never read about it happening, I can't believe it doesn't happen simply because it would mean, as it did, does with human beings, if a title becomes purely hereditary, eventually it's going to become weaker because often, of course, great leaders don't necessarily breed great leaders. And as you've often seen with royal families, very dominant great kings have produced extremely weak and unwise sons and I think the same principle must surely apply in the animal kingdom. There's no reason that her offspring should necessarily be better leaders than anyone else, except that as with human beings, they are born into the hierarchy, they're born into the royal lineage, which means they immediately have a sense of entitlement, definitely, and they also have a sense of dominance and leadership. That's quite an interesting one. And it's much more dominant, you know, we talk about the other matriarchal society of the area being the elephants. And while elephants most certainly do live in a matriarchal society, that dominance is really a, it's not a managerial role, it's a, well it is, it's a leadership role. Where it's not a dominance role, it's a leadership role where that female, the lead matriarch will make the decisions on where to go and drink and where to find the best forage. Whereas in a hyena clan, the matriarch is the most dominant female. She will eat first, she will dominate at kills, she will be the most, most likely the most aggressive and most likely to dominate the others. And you can see these two are ganging up on their cousin and definitely reaffirming that they are the children of the big cheese. I suppose, strictly speaking, we should call this hyena Oh, look, some others have arrived. That's Corky, who's just stood up. Let's look out for the white patch. And that looks like pretty to me. The daughter of November. She's a pristine-looking hyena. 
I've all gone to say hello to them now. And it is getting very dark here. We won't be here for much longer, everyone. We're just going to wait for the light to, light to fade on its own. We're not going to add any light. One of the hyenas, I can just see, they were obviously lying around the den here, has moved off into the night. Looked like a sub-adult, maybe June. And I suspect quite strongly that Pretty was just lying down around here. There you can see one moving off on the left-hand side of your screen. Hello, Joe, on Twitter. You want to know if they might mate with brown hyenas, these spotted hyenas? Oh, look, that's pretty. She's just gorgeous. And, Joe, the answer is no. Um, it would be the same as asking, would a... Um, let me try and think of a good example. There she is. Hello. Hi. It would really be like asking, would uh, a wildebeest mate with a sable antelope? And the answer is no. They're that distantly related. So they're the same family. They're a different genus, though, which means that they're unable to mate together. So it's not like the situation with a, um, a lion and a leopard, which are part of the same genus. Not like a lion, leopard, lion and a tiger, which then they can produce a, a, not necessarily a viable offspring, or like a donkey and a horse which can produce an offspring called a mule, and it's not like that. They're much more distantly related. Please excuse the focus. It's not Brian making errors. It's the lens, which is a bit of a problem. That's my knee. <laughs> Isn't that cool? He's so close. Hi. Hello. Another one. They're just too much fun, these chaps. Pretty's heading off into the night now. Okay, oh, no, she's lying down. And the last embers of the day just shining on her there. So we're into the changing of the guard, that beautiful time of the night, and I'm asked sometimes what my favorite time of the day is. Well, it's just before sunup, and it's just after sundown. Changing of the guard now, when all of the diurnal animals, the diurnal birds, have stopped singing. They're all going to find their places to roost, cuddling up together for the night ahead and the owls are ruffling their feathers and waking up. The night jars are taking to the skies, as are the bats, as they seek out a meal in the night. And also, of course, on the ground, the lions, the leopards, and the hyenas will start to go hunting or sleeping, as that one seems to be doing. But they will move off. Thank you. Laura. Um, Laura, you want to know if the den, when the den site changes, if the matriarch goes to another den site, will all the others necessarily go with her? And Laura, the answer is no, not always. Um, well, if she moves the den, you'll probably find they will go with her, most likely. But when they give birth, when a subdominant hyena gives birth, it's often not at the central den. And interestingly, when um, Madam gave birth, she wasn't, she didn't give birth at the central den. She gave birth at the den on Mvubu Road, and everyone else then moved to her, which was quite interesting. There was nobody at that den before she gave birth there, and then everyone else moved across there to join her. Corky, if I remember correctly, gave birth down on the Philemon's Cutline um, den, which is a long way from here, and sort of a week or two after her cubs were born, she brought them up to the central den. So, yeah, they probably do seek out the company of the matriarch if she is at the den and if she has cubs. If she doesn't have cubs with her, so I mean, once these chaps are sort of eight months old, or maybe even above six months, it's unlikely that she will spend as much time at the den as she does. And so then you'll probably find that cohesion around the den probably does break up a bit and they'll go to a number of different dens. Thank you, Laura. You can just hear them making their lovely little sounds. 
Yeah, just all in amongst the grass still. Well, we'll spend another three minutes or so here. And I'm just going to get hold of Sam quickly. I think he's trying to get to the lions. Of course, he has no idea what, about the roads yet. Why should he? And so I'm just going to quickly help, see if I can't help him to get in to see the lions. They also could, of course, could have moved by now. Sam, do you copy Sam? Look at them with their little tails up. There's one. Right close by here again. Can't get hold of Sam. Sam, do you copy Sam? Look at that. Mm -hmm. Hi. This hyena, everybody, is now one and a half feet from my snout. Hello. Sam is now calling me on the radio. Excuse me, Mr. Hyena. Sam, um, what is your position? Are you struggling to find the den? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're in that drainage line. They were in that drainage line where that you drove through um, as you just before I saw you on drive. Uh, you should get visual from them if they're in the same place. You'll get visual from them of them on the western side of Mvubu Road in that drainage line on the road. A affirmative. I mean, you, you know, if you just just back from where I first saw you in that drainage line, you'll see them there. Okay, Sam's on his way. See if they're still there. You can see how dark it's getting. A affirmative, Andrew. Andrew's also going to help Sam get in there. There's definitely a space, Andrew. Uh, maybe you can give Sam a hand. Now, Jamie was supposed to go out with Sam today to help him with the roads and that sort of thing. But she had to play mechanic because she's the most mechanically minded of us. And she helped to help fix Jigger, who returned from hospital today, unfortunately still injured. And so she had to take care of that. Just wonderful to spend a bit more time with these chaps. All right, everybody, I think we're going to leave here. We'll take a few more questions, just because it's getting dark and we don't want to put any light on them. Ooh. Nice question from Madison in Nevada. Um, Madison, you want to know if there's an alpha male in the hyena clan? Well. Not so much. Now, remember, we don't refer to an alpha female in a hyena clan. We refer to a matriarch. There is no alpha pair like there is in the dog pack. There is the matriarch, and then there is a separate dominance hierarchy for the males in a hyena clan. All of the males, however, are subordinate to all of the females within the clan. So although there is a male hierarchy, you wouldn't describe any of them as being alpha simply because they don't lead anything. It just means that they're able to dominate at kills. But unlike with a dog pack, a wolf pack, or a wild dog pack, where the alpha male will actually lead a hunt, that doesn't happen here. They're looking off into the darkness. You can see it's getting very dark indeed, and it's much darker, actually, in reality than it is on your screens. But everyone's very calm, and that is the last embers of the 5th of April, 2014. No, it's not 2016. <laughs> sure. Two years back. 
I've been doing my audio book. <laughs> and all of the letters in my audio book are dated 2014. <laughs> all righty. That's it, everybody. Um, I think we're going to leave. It is getting very dark here now. And like I say, they're too young to put light on them. So let's head out. We'll head towards those lines and see if we can't give a hand and find them. I suspect they probably have moved by now. So let's go and give a hand around there. And we'll come back here another time for some more special moments with the hyena clan of Juma. If we can start the car. As we did that, Madam's making her way off. The cubs have gone back into the den, and so it's the good time to leave. Hello, Mia. A very nice question. How long does it take to learn the roads here? Well, Mia, it depends on your spatial awareness. Not your sense of direction, but your ability to space yourself and have spatial awareness. Uh, it takes someone like me a bit longer than it takes someone like uh, Brent, for example, or Scott, uh, or Jamie. I think Jamie learned extremely fast. Um, and I don't know, it will depend on Sam. But I, I mean, within, within a week or two, he'll know where all the boundaries are and he'll know the main roads. And then I think sort of two weeks after that, he'll know all of the other roads. It's not a very large reserve, so... That's basically how it works. And I mean, he will know, he'll find a guy like Sam, if he's anything like me, he'll know where the lodge is. So he'll know uh, where the camp is. He'll have a, an orientation of where he is. But obviously, he won't know the individual sp spots. But I had a friend once and, who I worked with at Londolozzi, and he, I was training him, and he, he, he drove a road once, and he knew exactly where it was and exactly what its name was from just one drive over it. It was absolutely astonishing. And the road network at Londolozzi is extremely confusing. We've got about 250 kilometers. Uh, that is about, a, it's over 100 miles of roads there. And a much bigger reserve, obviously. And he learned those in about three or four weeks. And it took many people years to learn all of the intricacies of that road network. So it really does depend on the individual. I'm not particularly good at it. It's uh, probably got something, it's probably the same fault in my, in my being, in my makeup, um, that means I'm so poor at, uh, <laughs> at drawing. My ability to be spatially aware is uh, very poor indeed. <coughs> right, spotlight time. we be interesting to note what uh, Sam's spotlighting technique is. We've discussed the different spotlighting techniques. Ah, Sam's got the lines, brilliant stuff. Let's go across and have a look at them. Oh, sorry, no, we're not really, he's not in position just yet, but he has found them. So he doesn't need my help. We'll wait for him to get in position and then we'll link to him. So like I was saying, you'll have to check for his spotlighting technique. We've got the Jamie technique. We've got the Brentlier Smith technique. Brent, of course, can't keep his hands still, so even if he's talking, he'll have it like this. OK, let's go across to Sam and his first big predator sighting at Juma. We are by the lions, the first sighting of a pride of lions that I've had on Wild Earth TV. Myself and jean have just been missing through the block here, looking for the Nkuhumu, Pride. If I've said that correctly, I hope so. So Andre, was that right? I think that's right. Great, thanks, Andre. Okay. Wow, what a bit spectacular sighting. In the evening, this is the best opportunity that we're going to see active lions. Oh, man. The first predator that I've had on Wild Earth TV. I haven't had a predator yet, so this is my first time. And we were actually sitting a little bit earlier with the pride. Just, just, they were actually stalking a impala, and it was great to, to watch them be active. And they also even, uh, they were stalking each other. It was so much fun to watch them. They were very playful. 
But here we're sitting with him, as you can see, grooming herself. I'm starting to get to know the pride a little bit better. This morning, James was amazing. He was explaining the whole pride. I think that could be amber eyes. Is that amber eyes? Yeah. So, yes, yes, James this morning was helping me so much with my knowledge of this pride and the dynamics of it and the way in which it's uh, interacting with the territory here um, and the local uh, males that are here, the Birmingham males. It's, it's, it was fascinating to find out the dynamics of this pride and the type of food that it likes to eat. It's always interesting coming across a new pride. I'm always so fascinated by lionesses. They're such strong, big you know, individuals, you know, the pride and how they look after themselves. And when I was, when I was walking back in my, in my uh, walking in my training, I, I've came across lions a few times and just, I'm, I would be way more scared to come across a female lion than a, than a male lion. Um, I just had that feeling when I had, was at Londolosi. I, I was always so, I was very, very aware of, of the lioness. Beautiful light that's coming onto her eyes. You can see her eyes glinting. As you can see, they are lying down right now. And it's, yeah, you know, most of the time during the day, you're gonna get flat, flat cats, which means that they, I mean, they like to, to lie down during the day and, and take in, the, you know, take in the energy, get the energy back, lie under some shade, and get away from the heat of the sun. Sometimes the heat can really take it out of them, so they, they like to be flat on the floor. Maybe sometimes they'll play with each other and, and groom themselves and take, like I saw loads of ticks just under their eye this morning, and so you'll see them grooming and, and, and playing sometimes, but at night time, they're gonna get up and they're gonna start becoming a little bit more active. So if we're lucky this evening, we'll be able to see some activity, any activity, whether they get up and walk around or, or, or they start hunting, which means, oh, wow. Did you see, did you see him open her, open her mouth like that? Wow. How's it, Yelena? Beautiful name. Yes, these are all lionesses. I mean. From what I can see, I haven't seen any males in the area and there weren't any males this morning. So generally, females and, and youngsters will, will be together in their prides. And, and these are, are a group of female lions. So it's, so it's females, Yelena. Often, often the male will come through at different times of, of, like of their day. They'll go around and the males are the dominant ones that they protect the territory. The females, on the other hand, are you know, they rear the cubs and, and they create food. Sometimes they'll catch the food and the male lions will often take food from the females that they've hunted so hard to get. You know, it's like they've taken a lot of energy to get these um, prey and often the male just comes and, and takes it. I've seen that a few times. It's quite, a, it's quite exciting to watch. I actually watched a, a male lion who took over the prides huge, it was a big giraffe kill, and the male lion didn't let any of the other lions come in to the eating. It literally ate that whole giraffe. I watched it the whole morning just eat this giraffe, and then when it was getting tired, it would just put its paws on the belly of, of the giraffe. And, and the little lioness, was, it was so great, actually. The little lionesses would, would try, and, try and get to it, and the, the male lion would get angry and, and give a very loud growl to show dominance, to say, this is my kill, I'm eating. So it can be difficult sometimes for the prides. But they, when you watch a, a pride of lion eating, it's, it's also quite a remarkable thing. Just as I said, we were talking about the wild dogs a little bit earlier, and the wild dogs are so quick to eat their meals. Sometimes they can take, you know, they just take so quick. I think it's, it was like up to five minutes that the, the impala between 11 wild dogs took, took that apart. And much the same with lionesses, they will, you know, kill and they'll start eating it as much as they can and get the food, the nutrients that they need in order to be strong and fit. But yes, so thanks so much for that question, Yelena. I really appreciate it. It's a great question. And I think James was saying this morning that there, there's about three other uh, 
prides that will, will be in the Birmingham, Birmingham males territory, which is, which is quite very interesting. And I think one of them is called the, the, Sticks, the Sticks Pride. So if, if, if anyone's out there, they can tweet in hashtag Safari Live and give me the names of the prides that the, the male lions hold territory. And I, like I, th I know it's the Sticks and in Kumu, and I've, I've, in Kuhumu, I hope I'm saying this right. In Kuhumas, in Kuhumas. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna keep practicing that late into the night this evening. But if, if anyone could please tell me what the other um, pride is, I'd really appreciate that. It'll help with my learning and it'll all just be a great experience. Wow. And just in front of you, you can see the silver cluster leaf, what we saw a little bit earlier. So the silver cluster leaf. Yeah. And the lions. Now lions play an incredibly, incredibly important role within an ecosystem. That's you know, something that really, really fascinates me. It's, it's the, the, the relationship of a predator to a landscape and how this predator will regulate the number of species here, you know. If, if you didn't have the lioness and, and, the, and the leopard and the other types of predators within this landscape, it would, would really, de I think it would deteriorate, or I know it would deteriorate the landscape in such a way that the, the vegetation would become destroyed over time because the lionesses and the lions and the, and the leopards and even when you're overseas and jaguars and Pantanal will all regulate the species in the ecosystem and help for a more biodiverse, more rich ecosystem. And you know, that's something that you can learn from within biomimicry is that you learn that diversity is key within anything, within the ecosystem. To have other role players in the ecosystem creates resilience, it creates you know, decentralization. It's, it's incredible how a predator influences the landscape. And I'm, I'm really, really interested to learn a little bit more about how these lions will will influence and, and, and give me such rich experiences while I'm here on Safari Life. Alessandro on Twitter asked me a very interesting question, which was how many times will a lioness or a lion hunt in one day? So they're also very opportunistic animals. So if there's an opportunity to, to make a kill, they will do so. They will go out there and uh, will, they will see something moving. And if they can knock it, whether it's a little dacre or, or anything out there, they'll have that opportunity to take it down. So generally, from what I understand, it's, they'll, they'll make a kill, you know, it depends on what they're eating. If it's a small, um, like a dacre or something, they'll probably have to hunt in the evening. Um, or, or the next day, but sometimes when they're eating like a cape buffalo, for example, that will fill their stomach up, Alessandro, to quite, a, quite an extent that they would be able to maybe last a couple more days without any food. So I hope that answers your question. Um, that's what I understand of the, the, the way in which lions need to hunt and eat. It's also, yeah, so as I said, it's very variable on the, you know, the size of, of the prey that they're eating per day. But thanks for that. As we sit here with the lionesses, and you know, when I see a whole bunch of lionesses being sleepy, I almost feel my eyes joking. I'm excited as anything to be out here this evening with all of you. Um, hopefully, um, I'm, they're going to get up and walk around and see if they can see something and hunt. Um, in the meantime, go to James and see what he's up to. I tend to agree with Sam there. Sleeping lions definitely make me feel deeply sleepy indeed. So I'm quite pleased that as the day has come to an end, uh, I am not sitting with them sleeping. I'm surprised they haven't got up and moved, given how hungry they looked. But they are right around the dam today, and so I would keep an eye on the Juma Dam cam as the night progresses here and the day progresses in the Western Hemisphere and tomorrow progresses in the Eastern Hemisphere. I have got that right, as yes, I have got that right. And you may be in luck 
with the Nkuhuma Pride taking something down in front of the dam cam this evening. Animals, of course, it's one of the reasons that they drink during the late evening or the early evening. It's because they don't really want to be drinking around this time of night. They're very vulnerable when they're drinking. And of course, this is when the lions and the hyenas and the leopards start to get active. And as we saw, the hyenas have just left. They've gone foraging. And it won't be too long before those lions get up and start moving around. And this is a lumpy road of the boot. So we're heading towards the Juma Dam pan now, and we'll see what is there. Perhaps something is waiting there to be eaten. Also rather hoping to see where, or what is at the end of those male leopard tracks we had earlier. Um, keep an eye out there. Tingana might come back for a foray for a quick drink here this evening. I don't think Karula will come this far north if she doesn't have to but you never know, so keep an eye out there. I haven't heard any reports on them, save for the fact that they went into Hoffman's, which is just to the south of us. So I'm pretty sure they finished mating, and Tingana came back north. But who those male leopard tracks were that I saw this evening, I couldn't begin to tell you, to be honest, because they weren't big enough to be Tinganas. Maybe they're Mbullas. He has, as Brent said the other night, he put it very succinctly, he said he's become a dispersal male again. And that's normally the title that we'd give to a young male who was trying to sort of sort out him, sort himself out of territory. But in Mbulo's case, he's basically come to the end of his tenure. And so he will wander about the place, a male of no fixed abode. It's a little bit like you and me, Brian. Um, and he will he will basically just live out his days as a non-territorial male. All right, everybody, that's going to be it from Brian and I this evening. Thank you very much indeed for coming along on the drive with us. I've had a great time, I must say. Lovely lions and elephants and hyenas and some incredible scenery in the, as the autumn starts to take hold. Big thank you to Brian. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the final control of Kirsten, McLennan Smith and Rebecca. That's Brian right. Stump. And a big welcome and thanks to Sam. He's being filmed by jean Dre the Foot. And thank you all for your kind welcomes to Sam. I think it's wonderful to have him on the team, and I look forward to working with him. And I will see you tomorrow at 0600. Until then, stay safe and happy wherever you are. Bye-bye. Yeah, you can hear the lions are having a sleep. Joking, that was me making an impression of the lions sleeping. It seems that they're not going to be active this evening, or they will be active a little bit later, but not while we're out here. So they're just lying down. They've been very lazy today, actually. So it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a bad thing. You know, they're probably going to get their rest, and in a couple of hours, they're going to move out and, and see if they can find some prey for the evening and settle down for the night. But I just want to, you know, just want, well, while I'm here, you know, while it's the end of the, the drive, I just want to say thank you to everyone. It was before drive, I was very nervous and, and or rather, nervous is the wrong word, I was very excited. Um, I didn't know how it was going to be when I was out there, so it's been incredible. I've really enjoyed it. I've felt it live. It's been amazing, and I'm so grateful for this experience. I'm learning every single day, and I'm so glad that you guys are all there during this learning experience, as well as these beautiful lions who are sleeping that maybe can just hear me. But thank you to everyone on the team. Jean-Dre has been amazing behind the camera. He's really helped me in the thickets, as well as Kirsty on as the director. Thank you, Kirsty, and everyone on the team. James, you're a legend. Thank you, everyone. Good night.